Y'all are you gonna pull the trigger on me like that? No, I just wanted to see if we said anything hilarious that the, the folks needed to see. No we needed to see. <laughs> Hi folks, Lowell Morgan here from Georgia. Do you have a problem with my shirt? I like your shirt. I was more muscular a second ago. Oh. I was like up here. I was like, man, that's like just putting it out just there. Showing out my guns. Yeah, you need one of those uh, one of those bandanas on, you know, like the was it the fifty style, like empowered woman. Oh my! You oh know, yeah, like we can do it. No, it's uh, what was what was her name? We uh, it was World it. War Two. I'm sorry. It was uh, she had a name. She'd be out there with tools, like when the guys were out fighting the war. She was like, oh really? Rosie the Riveter. <laughs> Boom! That's some history for you guys. That's call you Rosie for this session. Beyond my age. Covered that um, in school, regardless of what your age might have been. Rosie, she's probably fake. Yeah. <laughs> you like my hair up or down? It's hard to see on screen. I don't think they can have an opinion about it. But me personally, I like it always. Oh, I thought you were gonna be like always down. <laughs> no, no, I like it. It's it's always f fresh and, and new and different. And, it always uh, is clean. I'll give you that. Well, that's something, right? Uh, I don't know about fresh, new, and different. <laughs> Anyways, hey everybody, it's Sean from The Good Dog, and we've got the lovely Laura Morgan, who's also known as Rosie the Riveter this this session. Well, we're teaching her about Rosie the Riveter, because apparently <laughs> they didn't cover that in her you know, class, or history young. class. Welcome back, guys. It was a good Q&A last week. Um, some folks added some nice comments about the question of the week, which was... Oh, um, pastry. Favorite pastry. Mm -hmm. So we got some good ones. We got some that I'm not even familiar with. Oh, really? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Check so there was, well, the cannoli I'm very familiar with. Ooh. Intimately familiar with I am cannoli. intimately familiar as well. Um, no, I'm, I'm too much. I'm going to just turn this a little bit. Okay. Hopefully we don't lose everything. Uh, somebody had an interesting cake. I can't remember what it was. It was some... I'll find it. Some high-tech contraption with buttercream frosting mm. and you can't ever go wrong with butter no you can't go wrong with any like vanilla frosting stuff with buttery goodness yeah just butter in general so thanks for answering the questions guys appreciate it I'm, we're going to try and come up with some uh, we don't have a question of the day actually even like engineered for this not yet but we'll, we'll come up with one spontaneously comes to us rosie so, the riveter rosie you Maybe ready to jump into this he's the actual question who honestly knows who that uh -huh. is i like this i like it and, Honestly. And guys and ladies, everybody who knows this, come right out. Don't feel bad. Don't. If you feel like you're going to make Laura feel bad that, <laughs> that everybody in the world knows who Rosie the Riveter is, don't feel bad. Support She's me. She's a fictional Just character. Just put it out there. She's got to be. They didn't teach her about her in history because she's probably from a TV commercial. She was part of uh, a whole kind of propaganda campaign to get women the girl who involved. Said, in, we can do in, it. In, in industry and, and going out, it was it was more important than just it wasn't like Superman. Yeah, but she like was that. fake. She was a, a symbol. Yes, yeah, she was a symbol. Look at our human encyclopedia is nodding. That means I'm smarter. Than she you. was she was a symbol. Absolutely, I, no one said that Rosie was real. Oh, okay. But Rosie had a purpose in history. Oh. The that one was who beyond. says we like we are we can do it right with the bandana. Am I, I right, so. guys? Yeah. Sean said, no, where's Sean said? Oh! <laughs> this is what, up in flames. And I, I won't even bring up the fact that a certain somebody sitting next to me oh my is gosh. a college grad, and this guy Why didn't, does that did, matter? didn't make it. It doesn't matter at all. You should have a more thorough education. No, no, no. Than, than I studied I economics. We don't study those stupid things. <laughs> Guys, we're going to move on along now that she's insulted uh, Everyone. half of our population out there, including... Uh... Everyone in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Are you done? I am. Okay, cool. I just, I'm defensive and sad. She's and defensive lonely. about anything she doesn't know about, so that's her MO. All right. Go ahead. Number one. Oh. From Katie Myers. Katie says, "What fictional character during World War II inspired legions of women to go out and, and participate in industry?" Like... <laughs> All right, sorry, 
Katie Meyer says, what are some good protocols Hi, or exercises to increase the dog's confidence? Mm. I know people usually say agility, but I don't see you guys use that. Um, or I see you guys don't use that. Curious says my dog is, um, he's slightly insecure and I'd like to nip that in the bud. She's pretty obedient and e-collar trained, so anything is possible for us. Nice. Katie, Katie, Katie. Okay, Katie, so this has been like, for whatever reason, it's been a, a topic of, of lots of discussion on the Good Dog page. Um, we just covered it. Somebody asked, I think Gary, um, uh, I can't remember Gary's last name, but Gary, I think he's in Australia, asked about um, confidence building, and I think I alluded to it, and so then it, he pulled me out and I had to like actually write up a whole Good Dog tip about it. So we, we covered it, and I wrote a couple notes just to make sure I don't forget, which maybe somebody else should have done in history class. <laughs> but moving on. So, uh, so the, the most important thing we do is not like, uh, we don't do agility stuff here. We don't do, you know, like extracurricular activities to try and like, <laughs> now you're going to burp to really insult It was them. a hiccup. It was like... <laughs> um, so just the basic training protocols and, and program that we go through is our biggest confidence building uh, approach. So, there isn't anything that we're like, okay, we've got an insecure dog. It's time to build confidence. Yeah. We do the same basic approach, same foundational uh, training techniques with all the dogs that come through here, and all the dogs end up building confidence and, and working through issues. So the main gig is that we're looking to get the, the training. Say you've got an insecure dog, a fearful dog, nervous dog, um, aggressive dog. It could be a lot of different things. We're using the training to override those initial impulses, right? So if your dog is fearful and likes to run away anytime it feels pressured or uncomfortable, then we use training, place command, recall, things like that to override that dog's initial impulse to flee the scene, to escape pressure, and, and get them to actually learn that they can tolerate it on their own and that they're okay and that nothing bad happens. Mm -hmm. So that's a real simplification of it, but that's a big part of it. If you can think about using training Leveraging training to override whatever the dog's impulse is that's troubling it, that causes it to want to flee. And then we use the training to say, you can't flee. you got to hang here. you got to be in place. Or if they're nervous about people, um, you can use uh, recall stuff to actually get them to recall to you. And that helps build confidence because typically really fearful dogs, all they want to do is run away. So the e-collar kind of flips the script because... Dog's perception, this is kind of a juicy one, but dog's perception that are, that are fearful, or, fearful or nervous is that the further I am away from you, the more comfortable I am. But you can use the e-collar to flip that and say, I'm going to actually make it mildly uncomfortable for you to be far away from me. But as you get closer to me, the e-collar goes off and then you actually flip the psychological perception of the dog that being next to me is really comfortable. Right which starts to create positive associations, which blows a lot of people's minds because they don't think you can use the e-collar for fear, fearful, nervous dogs in a positive sense like that, but we do it all the time. And so getting dogs over a cycle they're stuck in of fear, anxiety, nervousness, whatever, and using the training to override that is, is it's huge. But a big part of that is that the training isn't soft and negotiable. And that doesn't mean the training's hard and ass kicking either, but it, it means that as we're moving through the process, we're teaching, but we start to set rules and these rules it's really important that these rules are non-negotiable rules that are negotiable training that is negotiable training that is soft or is is uh, uh loosey goosey loosey goosey or are hopeful that the dog might interact or engage is going to create opportunities for the dog to resist and those opportunities will cause more friction more resistance and more stress in the dog which will perpetuate the cycle so non-negotiable rules once the dog is fairly taught is a big part of that program to where they stop if you can think about it when the rules become really non-negotiable and you pattern the dog long enough like that they stop resisting and they just get with the new program there's i used to run away i don't run away anymore i haven't been allowed to run away for two weeks uh, every time i want to run away they call me and so i just do this and that becomes the new pattern so um so that's a big big part of it and then e-collar um obviously is a huge aid in this because there's another psychological component and tell me to shut up because i'm going a long time no, but fine. there's another psychological component it's kind of important stuff this other psychological component of the e-collar is that it causes the dogs to feel like they're doing the work rather than the work being done to them. Mm -hmm. So if I've got a dog that's fearful of me and I put it on a long line and a prong collar and I start you know, reeling the dog in like, I'm a good guy, come on over here. <laughs> and we've got that same perception of 
fear of me and it's comfortable to be away from me and then I'm trying to change that by get, drawing the dog close, what happens is the dog is actually being being forced or compelled to do this in a way that feels very forced and compelled and obligatory by the dog in a negative way versus where the e-collar, the dog is feeling this, the sensation, has a leash there to guide it, but the dog is actually doing 99% of the work to, to do forward motion towards whatever the target me might be that the dog's nervous about. So the e-collar being able to correct at a distance and, and cause the dog to do the work rather than the dog perceiving that the work is being done to it. Uh, is a huge part of confidence building. So I think that's a, I'm pretty proud of that. It's a pretty good description off the off the cuff. Yeah. But um, I think if you can if you can kind of really grab onto that, that really explains how we build confidence here without doing a lot of other uh, you know kind of nothing wrong with any of that other stuff. Yeah. A lot of people are using it and it works really well for them. That's great. Excuse me, but we don't get into uh, all that other stuff. We just do our program and the way we do it, specifically tailored towards the dog, tends to create those really nice confidence building results. Yeah. Anything to add, Rosie? Oh. <laughs> Who's that? All right. <laughs> funny, funny, funny. Question number two. Give me one second. Uh -oh. um, this Bring is from Carrie Brewster. Hey, Carrie. Like Punky Brewster. Oh, could you, be a cousin. Is that your cousin? Could be a cousin. Tell us in the comments. <laughs> cousin, would be awesome. I was a Punky fan. Me too, big time. Um, how do you train a dog not to be possessive of food, guarding, growling, intimidating the other ho dogs in the household? Mm. Uh, we have a guy that is going home. Um, well, he'll be gone. He'll be home by the time you watch this. Um, mm -hmm. Named Rusty. Rusty came for some of the same exact things: resource guarding around people, but uh, primarily around dogs, uh, toys, and space, and even people and things like that. So, our go-to. It sounds like a broken record, but our go-to is always foundation work. And so, all the stuff we talked about building confidence in the last question actually causes dogs to be in a better state of mind, more confidence, more stability, and also firmer rules and understanding about where they where they sit in the pack mm -hmm. causes most dogs to just stop resource guarding. So from the moment that Rusty got here and we started laying down some rules and non-negotiable you know, rules and structure, the resource guarding, it didn't make sense anymore. He's like, I resource guard when it feels like there's some flexibility and give in the world and I can kind of push it. But in this world, he's like, ah, that doesn't make any sense. These guys aren't going to let me resource guard. So he hasn't even tried it. So um, now if you have regular resource guarding with uh, like if you're doing foundation work and hopefully you guys all know what I mean by foundation work because you can go to our website and look at all of our videos. Um, but if you're doing foundation work and still having problems in a more severe case, then with people we teach the out command. We do waiting for food and then we teach the out command, get the dog rock solid about outing around food at your verbal command. We use the e-collar for that and it works like a charm. For dog stuff, like with Rusty, once I got him confident and comfortable, I started bringing my dogs around and then spreading food out around them, lots of kibble around them, and letting everybody just kind of mingle and eat together while watching, watching, I almost called him Rosie, watching Rusty, <laughs> Rusty the Riveter, um, watching him to make sure he was going to behave himself. Now, if, if Rusty would have made a bad choice, I'd be ready to correct him firmly. I'd have the e-collar at a very high level, and that choice to attack or correct a dog, if inappropriate, deemed inappropriate by me, which it probably would be, I would correct very firmly. And then, and then Rosie, and then uh, Rusty would say, wow, that choice to, to resource guard doesn't really make sense. It's uncomfortable. Let me try and make another choice. And he might be uncomfortable for a little while as he tries to transition um, through that into accepting it. But that would be my, my first approach. And then more foundation work, getting the mind right, right? Why do dogs resource guard? Because they think they can, because they're insecure, because, you know, whatever, all this, these gaps in the relationship and, and the structure. So typically that's where it comes from. Yes, there's extreme cases of resource guarding, but those, like I said, tend to be more extreme. So that's how we did it. Um, foundation work, then uh, brought, brought uh, my dogs around and started spreading kibble out. If I didn't trust um, rusty, if I was nervous about Rusty, and there's been plenty of dogs I have been nervous about, then I muzzle the dog up. I make sure they're muzzle conditioned, and then I muzzle them up, and then I do that work around, and so that way I keep dogs safe. So if you have any doubt in your mind, muzzle muzzle the dog up that you're working with to keep them safe. Then bring other dogs around, sh have spread kibble around. If the dog makes a mistake, then the dog gets corrected with the e collar pretty firmly to say, "Don't make that mistake." Don't do anymore. that. Yeah. Cool. cool. Rosie, you like that one? 
This is not question number three. Okay. This is actually just for fun update from Jennifer Lloyd. I like these updates. She says, I want to thank you both for featuring my question on episode 12 Q&A. Mm. Your guys gave me a very detailed explanation, and I'm happy to report that I no longer have any problems with my dog breaking place command when people come over to the house. You don't say. Yes. Fantastic. He now takes me seriously, and I've noticed his behavior become a lot more respectful overall, and we're now working on the heel. Wish me luck. Yes, Yay. we wish you luck. That's so awesome. So thanks. cool, Jennifer. Thanks so much for, for reporting it in, too. Yeah, you know, we love uh, hearing that. Yeah. I know a lot of people are out there doing stuff, and they don't always have time or remember to let us know, but we really appreciate it when, yeah. when, when people do, because yeah. that's why we do all this stuff. So it's pretty cool when we get these good reports and things are going well. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much. Awesome. Yeah. Question three. This is from Heather Sears. Hey, Our Heather. Heather. Okay. Is she related to the Sears family? Do you own... The I store? Could, I could use some tools. I could use a dishwasher. Let us know in the comments below. Let's, let's talk, Heather. <laughs> free dog training? Free question and answers? For a midnight shopping spree? <laughs> Places closed Closing as much time. as you can carry? <laughs> Clutch and carry? Uh, okay. Heather Sears. Okay, sorry, hi, Heather. guys. <laughs> First off, I love watching your Q&As. You always make me smile with your witty banter. Oh. oh. Wow. Hey, we fed into it. Wow. Um, so I've been working on how Izzy, her nine-month yellow lab, greets people. Mm. She's on a prom <laughs> Uh-oh. No, guys, we lost her. It was just... It, it, it was that quick. We just lost her. <laughs> no. What happened? I was just thinking about Rachel the bear. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel survived the last Q and A and 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 let us let us have it with her real name. Uh, she she wasn't mad. No, she, she was her like real nickname, she's her like real I've heard name. a lot of them, but I've never heard the bear. Nothing is stupid as what you guys say. <laughs> exactly. Okay, sorry Heather uh, or Rachel and Heather. Okay. Rachel the bear. Rachel, the bear and Heather Sears department store <laughs> call us. Um, okay. So I've been working on how Izzy greets people. She's on a prong collar, and I make her place them down when people come after her. Mm -hmm. uh, when, after her. No, no, no. When people come after she house. has calmed down. I, what? <laughs> so I can't, I Can can't get rid of this. not chase your dog around? <laughs> She's on a prong collar, and I make her place them down when people come. Mm -hmm. After... She has calmed down. I let her go and visit, but she still pushes all over them and uses her body to push them around, <laughs> even if it's kids. Right, getting ready, yes. Yeah. Getting ready to switch her to a remote collar soon, and just want to mm. know how to correct her on this before I switch and before I make the switch and after. Thanks again for your help. Awesome. Okay, so you got two choices. You can leave your dog in place and just let your dog kind of sit and simmer, and and you know maybe your dog just struggles with <laughs> those kind of interactions. It's too much. Um, or if you want to address it, which it sounds like you do, uh, whether it's leash and prong or e-collar, you got to have one of those tools on. Um, you're using leash and prong, so you might as well let your dog drag it around, put your dog in place when you want to release your dog, break or whatever your release is, and then bring your dog over to the people. And then as soon as you start getting nutty behavior, right, it's, it's all arousal, excitement stuff. As soon as you start getting some arousal and excitement from your dog, your dog just, it, their, their brain starts to scramble and they just kind of go bananas. Give a pop on the leash. Now, the pop on the leash isn't saying you can't be friendly and you can't say hi to people. It's saying how you can do it. It's what kind of level of intensity and arousal can you interact with people. So I bring her over on a leash prong, do, 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 do. As long as she's polite, I don't say anything, I don't do anything. The second that she starts to even like get too wiggly, she doesn't have to do anything. She doesn't have to trespass on somebody. As soon as the arousal gets high, just no, and give a nice firm pop on the leash and let her go back to, to uh, mingling. It's your job just to cultivate what you like, what you deem is appropriate, and what's not appropriate. Right. Correct the inappropriate stuff, and she'll get the message very clearly. No yelling or anything just like that. If anything, just nope, nice, nice, calm no, and then give it a nice quick pop. And then, of course, the rules are always, whether it's an e-collar or a prong collar, let the dog tell you what level is valuable, right? So if you pop on the prong collar and the behavior continues, it's too soft. If you pop on the e-collar and the behavior continues, it's too soft. So then find the, the right level where it actually um, matters to your dog and your dog values it and prioritizes what you're looking for. Cool? Are we cool? Yeah. We're cool. Cool. All right. Kelp it. That was so funny. Okay, question four. This is from Herb Stanley. Of Morgan Stanley? <laughs> We're getting we need, into investing. We need some investment advice. 
there's actually you know some stuff we've been looking into so so comments let us know in the comments <laughs> we're reaching here but it's it doesn't hurt to right? it's a small world right <laughs> We could really make hey guys, out. We, we could. We this could, could we be could a make huge out after this session. Yeah, we got free washers. We got free advice on you know financial stuff. Financial. <laughs> I was trying to think of oh investing. That was the word. Right. Um, I mean, sky's the limit. All yeah. right, Herb Stanley. Hi guys, thanks so much for opening up to our questions every week. I bought your DVD and we are three weeks in. I'm oh, proud to awesome. say my Thanks. dog and I are making tons of progress. Awesome. Mm. Okay, down to business, smiley face. My pup is an Australian cattle mix rescue. She's getting a good handle on the prong basics, place sit down thresholds. Her walk and heel are coming along great. Her problem is she's extremely touch sensitive and can't take more than a pat on the head before spinning or moving around. Mm. As soon as there's physical contact, she will freak out and lick whatever she can extensively, almost like a sensory overload. Would you guys have any tips on an extreme liquor and overall extra sensitive dog? I have not gotten around to getting her on the electric collar yet. Thanks so much. Is it herb or herb? herb. It's well, herb. herb. No. It's probably herb. herb. Herb is something you cook with, right? We're, we're really like finding a lot of gaps this, this weekend. It's a lot of gaps. A lot of gaps. It's all right. It could be either. I think it's herb. I think it's herb. Probably herb. So herb seeing as you're a human and not something that we're going to cook with, we'll call you by your right name. Um, so, for the, for the touch-sensitive dog, I don't know what happened to her. For the touch-sensitive dog, okay. So, as long as it's not discomfort that, that your dog is experiencing, like, if, if it feels like excitement, that's one thing. If it feels like your dog is uncomfortable with it, then I would say have a doctor look at it and see what's going on. If there's any weird, you know, dogs can have all sorts of different stuff, uh, you know, with, with touch or with pain and things like that. But it doesn't sound like that's what you're saying. It sounds like it's more of kind of a, like you said, sensory overload, like more excitement issue stuff. So that's an interesting one. Um, it sounds, once again, you've heard me say that, say this word a few times, arousal. You know, overly aroused dogs tend to do overly aroused things like that kind of like hyper licking thing or jumping on people or just, you know, overly wiggly or whatever it is. So um, I think if I was you, he's, he's using our DVD, right? Yeah, and, and our, prong, our, prong, stuff. prong stuff. No, no e-collar yet. I, I, would, I would really take a look at leaving the leash and prong on and um, and working through that stuff, right? And which might sound weird, but I'd probably put my dog in a sit and and then just kind of like, you know, do a light touch and if it creates some some pretty extreme reaction, then I'd pop, right? And it might sound unfair or weird or awkward to be correcting for that, but we're not correcting so much like bad dog. We're correcting more of like trying to teach the dog to manage arousal and, and, and learn how to deal with that in a different way. So I'd be very curious. If it's not a physical thing, if, if you don't feel like your dog is uncomfortable or has anything going on in that sense, then I would definitely start addressing it because 99 out of 100 times just watching your face. Is everything all right? You look, yeah, yeah. Oh, I have stuff right. to say. I'm trying to remember Oh, okay. It. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. You look very intense for a second. Um, 99 times out of 100, it's an arousal issue and it's an impulse control issue. So leash and prong and, and give a quick pop and uh, let your dog settle and then go back to touch again and then address, let the dog settle, then go back. My suspicion is that you can probably, uh, you know, within a couple of days, work your dog into a different gear where that touch is not creating that, that yeah. response with that. Do you agree? Totally. Yeah. I was just going to say, I was just looking at your thing. You say you're three weeks in, which is a good amount of time, but maybe not so much for her with her sensitivity. So what we do, um, like we had this dog, Xena, who was extremely touch sensitive on mm. her back legs. Mm. And on the first week or so, I mean, you couldn't even walk by her back legs without her spinning her butt around and, yeah. and getting all weird about it. Yeah. But she stayed with us for three weeks, I believe. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the three weeks, I mean, she was, and this is us doing like a board and train, so you're not doing quite the same amount of intensity. But it took, you know, until like two weeks, two and a half weeks in for her to like, no problem with any touch stuff. But you would have thought, and we actually checked to make sure she didn't have any physical um, 
things going on with her back legs. So you may see just with a ton of this foundation, duration, duration, duration for this dog. Because yeah. that licking stuff and all that stuff, that probably isn't connected to anything physical. It's probably just much more of an obsessive kind of anxious, nervous behavior. So by continuing the foundation, eventually getting on e-collar, which would be awesome for you, yeah. but then just doing a ton of duration and just a ton, a ton, a ton of structure, this dog should, you should see those things fade away, you know, uh, over time. Cool. So, yeah, that, yeah. I think so. Let let us know, by the way, because yeah. it's kind of an interesting one. It's not a question we get all the time. Yeah. yeah. So I'd be very curious. Hey. Man, <laughs> I'd be very curious. A lot of licking going yeah. on here. We started talking about licking. Everybody got inspired. Go. Um, so I'd be really curious to see uh, what you get and mm -hmm. what works. And uh, so, so would you do us a favor? Let us know yeah. when, when what you see in the yeah, next yeah. couple of weeks. All right. Yeah. And eventually, e collar would be great. Nervous dogs. Yeah, absolutely. Question five. Uh, Coralie, evoques. Hmm? Evoques. Evoques. Oh, I don't have that same last name. I have Coralie Frile. Why? Oh, because I mixed, oh, mixed the wrong them names. Up. No, no. Joshua. Sorry, Eve, Joshua. That's Evoques. <laughs> okay. Evoques. Coralie. She says, hi, guys. Hey. I adopted a rescue about six months ago. He's a two-year-old American Bulldog mix. I was wondering how much I should let him sniff and mark on walks. How do I know if he actually needs to go or if he just wants to mark? Is he dog reactive? He is dog reactive. Mm. We're working on it, so I can't mm -hmm. let him off leash anywhere but in my backyard where there's nothing else but his own smell. Thanks so much, guys. I hope this will help other people as well. Okay. Thanks, Coralie. Corley, so here's the way we do it with all this stuff. So we do a 90-10 structured walk, right? Um, dogs can hold the potty. They, it's not like, I mean, of course, if you come out after like a nine-hour, you know, uh, sleeping all night, then I'd probably let the dog go straight away. But other than that, then it's structured walk. It's no sniffing, no marking, no targeting. And I don't know if there's any other rules. Um, no staring, no lunging, no barking, all those yeah, things. Yeah, but yeah. basic sniffing, marking, targeting. Yeah, yeah other dogs. So um, keep your dog on the straight and narrow. Get your dog just working on that heel really nice in the structured walk. And then think of the rules of the, of the structured walk being 90-10. So 90% of the time, or I would say 90% over the complete duration of your walk, your dog is walking in a perfect heel next to you. And then 10% interspersed throughout that walk at your discretion when you release your dog, then give your dog the whole leash, the, drop the leash, hold on to it, but give him the whole length of the leash and say whatever your release command is for probably go potty and then let him do his thing. And if he's got to go, he, he'll go. And if he doesn't, if he's snipping around, like snipping around, if he's sniffing around or snipping around um, and doing a bunch of window shopping, then I would just say, hey, heel, call him back into heel and get, get moving. So it's a pretty easy one um, once you give the dog the breaks. So the difference is, we can either let the dog sniff and mark and do that stuff on his own and on his own permission, which will cause issues in the training and issues in the relationship and most likely behavioral stuff with a reactive dog is the last thing you want. Um, or he can do the sniffing and marking on your cue, on your permission. So he still gets to do those, but he does them in a healthy way rather than an unhealthy way. Mm -hmm. So with, with dog reactive dogs on that walk, that walk needs to be your walk, heavily structured, lots of rules, your dog looking to you for permission. Can I go potty now? Can I do this? That's what you need your dog looking to you. Mm -hmm. if, if you're out there and you're allowing um, any kind of willy-nilly walk stuff, any nilly like, oh, think about it this way. The dog, I always say this, the dog that can pull to a tree or pull to a bush to pee is the same dog that feels that they can bark, lunge, or react to another dog. So it's all totally, totally connected. So 90-10, make it highly structured, and your dog goes potty on your release, he'll be fine. All right? Is it Coralie? Coralie. Thanks, Coralie. Okay. We've got question number six. This is Joshua Friel. Hey guys, my two-year-old dog has anxiety while riding in the car. She gets mm. in the car fine. Mm. Once I start driving, she pants, whines, and occasionally vomits. I have done duration work down while driving, but she still pants and shakes, but Ooh. doesn't break the down. Mm. I've used down because she equates down with being calm, but it's not working to calm her. Whenever I arrive at my destination, the panting and shaking stops. She's not allowed in or out of the car unless she's calm. Any thoughts on how to make a car ride more pleasant for her? Um, P.S. When I first adopted her, she wouldn't get in the car, and we worked through that. Mm, okay. So <coughs> thanks for the question, Joshua. Um, this is a tough one. I mean, it sounds like your dog came with, with some car anxiety issues, yeah. and you managed to get over the, the big humps. 
uh, as far as like the major resistance, but your dog is still uncomfortable with it. It's a common thing. There's a lot of dogs, like really great dogs out yeah. there that get in cars and they just have a, they have a hard time with it for whatever reason. But uh, what I want you to think about is just like there's also, you know, adults and kids that have a hard time with motion sickness stuff. So your dog could have issues with that and that could have actually triggered the uh, the major resistance to the car because your dog might know, like when I get in cars, I feel really crappy yeah. and feel really sick. So I would honestly, uh, it sounds like you're doing all the right work training wise with the duration work and, and, and teaching your dog, uh, you know, just basic foundation stuff. I would go, I'd actually go see a doctor and I'd see if there's any medical yeah. um, recommendations like Dramamine for dogs. Yeah, I don't know if you can do take. Dramamine for dogs. I think you can. Um, and I, I know I've had clients with with, uh, with issues with uh, car sickness stuff and I know they found ways around it through through medication. And then of course, if you've got a long drive, um, you could do some kind of anti-anxiety medication to, to help your dog out. So we're by no, by no means like the throw medication at every dog situation, but it sounds like you've already done a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. and it sounds like your dog came with some some uh, some issues towards the car. There might be just a physical component, it might just be a, a physical thing here where your dog is uncomfortable and has motion sickness. And uh, if you get some drama meat or something on board, might be able to sort it out and then make your dog really actually enjoy the ride. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah. It's a good way. I mean, the, the figuring out, making sure it's not a medical thing, and then just kind of working through after that and seeing where you get. Yep. Yep. Sounds good. Okay, cool. Let us know. Yeah. Let us know how that how that works out. Question seven. This is from... You see me almost. I'm starting to get all... Oh, yeah. It's someone, about 24 some, hours. Someone's got bad allergies. Bad, bad allergy allergies. O'Shea. Sneezy McGreezy. And... Uh, <laughs> I'm on some Claritin right now, but it's feeling it's like it, I'm starting. In, yeah. I can we'll see, go, I'll go grab nose. you one. Okay. See how I do. Hopefully, I make it through without. Question blowing. seven. Yes, go ahead. This is from our buddy. What? What? The he... frequent flyer? <laughs> he needs a frequent flyer. The good dog frequent flyer? <laughs> we actually have some other frequent flyers as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, Artem, our buddy. Question seven. The Hello, Ukrainian Sean and Laura. <laughs> I will get my first e-collar next week. Um, my lazy dog just can't wait to have it on. <laughs> and of course, it's a mini educator. Yay! Yep. I so I I think I took off one part. He had a, a two-parter, so I just picked one yep. of the questions. So I already you get trimmed down, buddy. Well, um, I already know a lot from you about how to introduce e-collar to the dog properly, and usually mm. you do this by doing e-collar recall. Yeah. But I still have two questions about e-collar introducing to the dog. One question. Mm. Is there any other way to introduce the e-collar? If the dog, for example, is very familiar with the place command, can I introduce the e-collar through place command? And what is the difference between the ways how we introduce e-collar to the dog from the dog's point of view? Is recall the most understandable for the dog, or what is it? This is a very on-point question, by the way. Artem, you knock my socks off, buddy. Yeah, this is a great question, and uh, it's timely because we're shooting, excuse me, we're shooting our um, e-collar DVD which is big, big news. We're shooting our e-collar DVD at the end of this month and it's gonna be a knock your socks off extravaganza. We've got a, a whole amazing crew and amazing shoot going on. It's gonna be it's gonna be awesome. But we're also shaking some things up as far as what we're going to be doing, the order of, of training and introducing the collar, specifically so it's easier for regular owners, not people that are dog enthusiasts out training every day, um, so what I'm getting at, Artem, is that yes, you can train, you can condition the dog to, to any um, to any of the commands. You could do sit, um, you know, find the dog's working level, and then leash on the dog. Sit, press the button, guide the dog up with a little bit of leash pressure. Butt hits the ground, button goes off. The dog goes, oh man, that's that's oh thank you. Got some Claritin coming down the pike. Um, so, so you could do it with sit, you could do it with down, uh, but I wouldn't recommend it with those. I think those exercises are a little bit, they're, yeah. they're very short, and I think the clarity, because you, your question was, is there one that's better to, uh, to teach with? And what I find, uh, so here's the three that we tend to go with. Um, we do either recall, um, uh, um. we do recall, we do e-call or heel, or we do place command. And I think all of those work really well. Um, I haven't seen, I haven't found myself um, any one of them that, that yields a better training result and one that causes less 
um, clarity about what the command means or what the e-collar means. So I think it's really about just that simple conversation of pressure on, guide the dog into position, pressure goes away when the dog's in position, and that becomes a very clear conversation for the dog that, oh, that's how I turn the e-collar off. I mean, it's basic escape training. So uh, there's part of me that says, you know, with the recall, the long line recall, that maybe there's even more like depth of clarity because the dog it's a longer distance it's a longer duration like kind of w resolving the exercise a little bit more involved but i haven't seen anything that would make me say that's the way you should do it um we do e-collar heel all the time to start dogs off and they're all you see all the dogs here they're all bouncing around doing their thing so we're actually probably going to go on to our in our dvd we're probably going to go um uh, e collar place first. Place first. And then and then start recalling this is top secret, so don't make me come to the Ukraine and shake you down. But it's not really top secret anymore no. now. Okay. Um, so we're we're probably gonna look at doing e collar place because it'll be easier for owners and then uh, be able to recall the dog off of place mm -hmm. because one of the other components that's challenging with um, with e collar recall is that dogs that have already been previously trained sensitive to the leech pressure or proximity of their owner don't like to wander away and then you're trying to like do this dance the whole time to like get away from the dog so you can recall them and so if uh, if that's the case, like teaching the dog sit first and then recalling the dog out of sit, but we're going to augment that and probably do um, e-collar place and then recall the dog out of that. And then once the dog's super solid inside the house, then we're going to transfer it to outside. So the cool thing about this is you don't have to do it like big outside recalls yeah. to make great stuff happen. You can do it in a really small environment, get the dog really straight on what the commands and e-collar mean, and then you can transfer it outside and it's like, oh, it's all there. Yeah. You just have to proof it. So hopefully that answers your question. I think you can do all the different um, exercise all the different behaviors, but I would probably stick. I probably wouldn't use sit or down as my first ones. I'd probably do something that's a little bit more involved, like not that you couldn't, but um, I would do e collar, heel, place, or uh, recall. Cool, cool, thanks, buddy. Yay. Stay warm out there. Hey, okay, question eight. This is from Emma Birchall. Hey, Emma. She says, Hey, one up over here. Um, so a new puppy is coming home in two weeks. Is it acceptable for my current dog, who's a good dog and eight about eight years old? Thank God. Clarity. <laughs> um, good with other dogs. So her current dog is eight years old. He's yep. good with other dogs, chill, neutral guy. Yep. So is it okay for that dog to growl at the new pup when she goes near him? If he's chewing a bone or toy, etc. I mean, I don't want to punish him for growling, but his resource guarding towards dogs is mild or moderate. Mm -hmm. We do all the foundation stuff, and he's an awesome dog in every other way. I'm just wondering about how we should respond when a new puppy encroaches on his space. I do my very best to keep puppy away from him, but is management my only solution? Background, we frequently have young puppies in my house for boarding, so I know he, how he reacts, but our puppy's coming home in two weeks. Great. Okay, so... Um... This is a really good question and it really depends on your dog, right? So with my guys, I really trust them. They're all, you know, I've got Junior who's 15, Belle who's eight or nine, yeah. Manny who's five going on 110 because he's the laziest guy in town. Um, but they're all really solid with other dogs and I, and I trust their instincts with other dogs. And it seems with the older dogs, they get, they're pretty darn good at correcting and giving information to puppies. Uh, so as long as your dog's, everything you describe, your dog is really stable, it makes really good choices, really solid and social. Mm -hmm. And so what your dog is doing with the puppy is setting puppy boundaries, which is actually really good stuff. So as long as those boundaries look appropriate, as long as he's not damaging the puppy, I'm totally down for it. Because usually I, I say, don't let dogs work it out. This is one of those few contexts where with the right dog, a puppy interaction with an older adult dog setting yeah. those boundaries is a really cool thing because they do it better than, than we do in a lot of ways. And so it'll teach that puppy to be more respectful. Now, if you see things getting out of hand and you see the conversation not landing with the puppy and the, and the, your adult dog is, is getting more intense about it, then you might have to step in and do something about it. But it doesn't sound like that. I don't think you're going to have problems with it. So my recommendation would be let that, let that older guy, within reason, as long as it's being appropriate, set up some boundaries for yeah. that pup and your puppy will quickly learn. I mean, Junior does it all the time, even with like non-puppies that come mm -hmm. in here and they're like getting to his face and he's like, Arr. and so it's just, that's how dogs communicate. As long as they're being appropriate with it, it's cool. Yeah. Cool? Cool. cool. All right. Okay. Question nine, it's just for fun, quickly, from Lindsay Ray Fontaine. Yeah. She kind of asks a question, but it's not real, so we're not, 
we can just give a quick answer. Okay. Um, should I have taught my dog recall on e-collar before heel? Basically, I took him to the park on a long line. He just followed me around. I had to throw a stick for him to get him the heck away from me so I could call him over. She says, this isn't a real question. Just a weird way to say thanks again. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so uh, Lindsay Ray Fontaine. Yeah, Lindsay. Lindsay, that's awesome. So, uh, so she taught her, she taught her dog heel first. Yeah, yeah. So, well, the the thing is, you taught your dog heel first, and that means be right next to me. So it's not surprising that your dog is like, I gotta be right next to you. Right. So what I would do is I would teach some stuff like downstays mm -hmm. and teach your dog, you know, like that he can be be away from you, yeah. and then do some recalls like that. And I know you're celebrating it. You're not really upset about it. But what I would do is to get your dog back in balance is make sure that he gets used to being able to be away from you. You know, when you do yeah. teach recall, don't constantly recall him back. Make sure he gets enough time being able to forge out so he's like, okay, I can actually do that. Because if you correct him every time he goes out, he's gonna eventually just stay in a little bubble, which is what kind of the heel command has taught your dog already. Bye, Thank Lindsay. you. All right, question number nine. This is from Instagram. The handle is a full house. Uh, the question is, this is my- John Stamos. Oh my gosh. Is this John Stamos? Please put in the comments. If <laughs> comments below if you're John Stamos. You don't have to say it outright. Sign, just, sign, just a sign. Picture. Oh, oh, but also just a sign, like some sort of reference yes. to a yeah. Reference to a, a an to obscure obscure episode. Exactly. Or something. Like what would Michelle say if someone was being rude? No, that's the other girl. Wait, all right, we'll talk about it later, John. All right, my pups are friendly towards people and each other. Mm. How do I introduce them to other dogs? Also, not sure what to do when we're on walks and other dogs who are not on a leash or in a fence come charging out at us. Thank you. Uh, this is a full house. Um, John. So John. Um, so for off-leash dogs, you have to decide how you want to approach it, right? So I'm pretty stern with that stuff just because I've seen a lot of clients come through here. Uh, with dog issues, dog reactivity, dog aggression stuff because their dogs have been bum rushed when they've been on walks. So I'm pretty firm about recommending to clients and, and my own dogs that I don't let any dogs come running up to us off leash. And it sounds like that's what you're looking for as well. So um, there's a variety of things you can do. Um, I usually just I'll put my dogs behind me and I'll use either a pet convincer, which is CO2 compressed air, which works really well for like 99% of dogs, just a quick psh and the dogs will typically scatter. I've, I've, I've managed to avoid a lot of little dogs jumping into big dogs' mouths just by using those uh, or using that. Um, you could use pepper spray if you're in, a, in an area where it's really like, you know, combative and challenging. Um, what else, you can use a walking stick. I know some people use that. I have, we have friends that are trainers that live like in the, the third world of, 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 you know, it's not really the third Three world, dogs. but like oh. lots of, like yeah. my friend in, in um, Curtis is wearing Kentucky or no? No, he's in Clarksville, Tennessee. 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 And he has to like carry heavy gadgetry to try and, I mean, it's literally a war zone out there when he's walking dogs. So hopefully you don't have, I mean, he's probably in Hollywood in the hills. So, yeah, exactly. So you probably shouldn't have anything that at heavy duty. Oh yeah, that's right. John. Right. So, <laughs> I mean, you could always, with with your budget, you could always hire bodyguards for your dogs to just kind of travel along with you. Just whatever you but, want. But uh, I would go for some tools like that. Just get a pet convincer. They're, get pet convincer two off Amazon. They're like 30 bucks. And I always carry one when we go to the park and they work really, really well to keep dogs away. It's a great, easy, cheap choice that doesn't cause any harm to the dog. So you don't have to feel bad. You don't have to worry about like any of these big major lawsuits because you're a famous guy and they yeah. like, see deep pockets or anything yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. And then um, the, the other, other part. The other part was uh, how to introduce how to introduce dogs. So typically, if I'm trying to introduce dogs, uh, I just walk them together. Um, it's really easy, low low pressure uh, way for dogs just to get comfortable and familiar. A lot of times, dog issues stem from dogs being excited, stressed out, and then trying to figure things out too quickly when they haven't had a chance to get to know each other, and then they make a bad choice. So um, just take a take. If you know, I don't know what your situation is, but take a couple dogs, whatever they are, for a walk. Let them just, you know, let them just stroll with you. Mm -hmm. um, if you've got any concerns about them being, uh, you know, having any dastardly intentions, then you've got to really walk them in a really structured fashion. Yeah. And then there's a whole protocol for that, which I can't really get into right now. But I, I would say, just do a nice walk, 
see what you get from the dogs. If the dogs are all comfortable and They're nobody cares about each yeah. other, then you don't have to really worry. Then you could bring the dogs in the backyard and you supervise. Your pet convincer could be a, a super helpful tool if anybody gets you know, in an accelerated, yeah. excited state. It's a great way to break that down. Um, so start with the walk, see what you get. If anybody looks tense or nervous or upset, then they're probably not ready to be meeting. Um, if they all look like they're all having a great time, then uh, you can let them off in, you know, in the backyard and, and keep a real close eye and supervise and, and yeah. see what you get. Um, introducing dogs, social stuff. There's always a, uh, you know, there's always a, uh, an element of risk because dogs are dogs, and you can always get, you know, there can always be trouble. So just be careful and, and try and really read the dogs really well. Yeah. Cool. Good one. Call us, John. We're in your neighborhood. Okay. <laughs> Question 10. This is question 10 from Instagram. Jor Jordan Yell B. Jordan Yell B. That's a hard one. Yeah. Or Jordan Yell B. Um, hey, Sean and Laura. Hey. Um, after luckily stumbling upon you guys and your awesome work, I feel so lucky to have found you. Yay. Thanks. I have a seven month old lab mix and she's been leash and collar trained, but she's not yet on an e collar. Anyways, <laughs> she's great with commands when she's on leash. I heals with a great automatic sit, does sit down, place on her thresholds, and will wait for food, and does the crate. Mm. Great dog. Yeah. Luckily, nice she's work already. <laughs> yeah. She's really been testing boundaries. For example, she'll step two feet off the placemat and look at me with a haha, technically, I'm still on the mat look, mm. which sometimes requires up to five firm corrections before she complies. She's also really bad about aimlessly wandering the house as if she's looking for something to get into, which often ends her getting into the garbage or stealing things off counters. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how much of this is normal puppy behavior or lack of stimulation, even though she goes for long walks, plays long games of fetch, along getting meals from food puzzles, and much more. Goodness. How realistic is it for her to become more calm around the house? Time. Yeah, you literally are. Um, how realistic is it for her to become more calm around the house at her age? If it's a reasonable goal, how do I get her to cool her jets into a calmer state of mind? Please help. I'd love to hear what you have to say. I'm guessing e-collar. Is that what she said? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's Marty Ben. So, so I mean, e-collar, we, you know, we, we, we're, we're big fans of e-collar, and, and I think we feel like every dog should come with one because then you no know, owners have to be frustrated, and, yeah. and dogs can all behave really well, and you can have freedom and, and take your dogs off leash places, and so it's just that's an awesome thing. Yeah. But to answer your question directly, uh, your dog is getting all of its needs met from everything you describe. Yeah. You're like the super awesome dog owner. And um, mental stimulation, physical activity, all that stuff, it's time to set some rules and it's time to hold that dog accountable for some rules. Doesn't mean that your dog can't still be a pup and have fun, but there needs to be a little more balance, I think. I think it can be a hard one to discern when they're that young, what's appropriate and like what kind of discipline and how much duration and all that stuff. But you know, we get puppies in here, you know, we had purple in here at four months and she was, you know, doing full e collar train and she was doing duration work and would she rather be like swinging from the chandelier and like going banana? I want to swing from the chandelier, from the chandelier, I <laughs> want to fly like... Oh. Okay. <laughs> so... Um, so yes, Play the song, so, uh, so purple would have loved to have been doing other stuff that, you know, pups want to do, but, um, she was more than capable of learning structure rules and discipline and, and being an awesome dog. So at four months old, she was completely off leash trained, completely reliable and super awesome with duration work and things like that. And that's four months. So your dog should have no problem doing some more of this stuff. I would ask for uh, more compliance. I would start to share firmer rules and uh, I would make that stuff pretty darn non-negotiable so your dog gets it and stops pushing against the rules so it can relax into it. And then make sure you keep up all the other good stuff. Sorry, dogs digging their nails into me. Um, all the other good stuff that you're doing um, uh, the fun stuff, the play, the stimulation, everything like that. But it's time to start asking a little bit more of that dog. Um, you don't want to wait until it's older and then you're really trying to work against a bunch of other more challenging stuff. So let's get that stuff on board. Let's start treating it more like a, like an adult dog and uh, start setting firmer boundaries. Of course, if you go to the e-collar, it's really a step above as far as 
you typically don't see as much breaking. You know, your dog knows with leash and prong like that you need to be close to correct. And yeah. uh, and your dog, is it a lab? Stubborn stuff. Um, uh, a lot of these dogs, you know, can be kind of tough with the prong collar. And you might think that you're correcting firm and the dog is like, that that's not even registering. So might be time for another for another tool. Um, I, not that you couldn't do it without the yeah. collar, because you absolutely can. Um, but you just have to make sure that you're letting the dog tell you what kind of pressure when you correct is valuable for the dog. And the way you know that is by the dog's behavior changing. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do with the leash and prong. Treat it, treat your dog more like an adult dog in the training sense. Keep doing all the other awesome stuff you're doing. And then if you want to go to e-collar, same rules apply. Um, treat it like an adult dog, um, but you'll probably see a lot more, um, you'll see the behavior kind of accelerate as far yeah. as uh, the compliance and, and all that good stuff, because then the dog knows the long arm of the law is on them at all, all time. times, and that changes everything. So, if you just want to use the prong, if you're doing like a straight up correction, you can also try doing the correction to the side, with a little bit more of a pop, mm -hmm. like just, you know, the leash can almost be like at the top of the neck, or kind of like down here, and just... And you might get a pop more, to the side is yeah. way more valuable than a pop up or down or something like mm -hmm. that. So quick and sharp, right? Not some, yeah. but quick and sharp to where your dog goes, whew, really want Never to get mind. their attention. Right. Yes, I want to stay on this place command. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three drink. Okay. One, two, three. We're going we're gonna to sign off now, guys. I've got actually a consult phone call, oh, yeah, so yeah. I don't have time for uh, for going it's down just this song. memory lane. No, here. it's not memory lane. It's guys, Sean O'Shea from The Good Dog. Rosie the Riveter, also known as Lovely Rosie the By Riveter. By the way, I was looking it up, and it is the girl who says, oh, you knew that. Oh. We weren't disagreeing with that. Oh. <laughs> we were just disagreeing with everything else you said. Anyways, guys, this is Q&A, the Good Dogs Q&A Saturday. <laughs> Thank you 18. so much for, for joining us. Number 18, we're rocking, we're almost ready for syndication here mm -hmm. in, in retirement. Um, the question of the day is... Did anyone else know who Rosie the Riveter is? Come with it, guys. Come with it. Come on. Show me Show me what you guys know. I know you guys what about know, those know your history under out there. 30? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter? Okay. It's not an excuse to be dumb. All right. Okay. All right, guys. Love you. See you. Bye.